Leading Britain's conversation. The Nigel Farage Show. Good morning, everybody. Well, the summer holidays are almost upon us. Mrs May continues to put a brave face on the Chequers deal, the Brexit plan. Uh, and yet, the Sunday Times today was some pretty extensive polling done by YouGov uh, telling us that there could be really, really big change around the corner. Whilst right now, the Conservative Party are only a point or so behind Labour, voters in this poll are giving some big warnings that they're prepared to shift, and perhaps the shift in numbers, the likes of which we've never seen before. 38% of voters said they would perhaps be prepared to back a party that was explicitly anti-EU. 24% of voters said they would back a party that was anti-EU, tough on Islam and anti-immigration. And 33% of voters said they could well vote for a party that actually uh, sees itself as being pro the European Union. So on both sides of the divide, people saying that they could shift their vote, but the, but the implications for May are pretty serious. In terms of personalities, in terms of individuals, well, Boris Johnson fares better than Mrs May, Jacob Rees-Mogg slightly behind, and all the other contenders, whether it's Michael Gove or Jeremy Hunt or Sajid Javid, really trailing in the wake way, way behind. But what this poll says is that people are feeling very, very uneasy indeed about what Mrs May is doing. And so the speculation is, where will that vote go? Would it go to UKIP? Well, we saw a five-point rise in UKIP's polls last week. Could it go to a new political party? And lots of speculation um, about that. Either way, has the Chequers deal, has it so disenchanted Tory voters, has it watered down the Brexit message to such an extent that for many it's virtually unrecognisable? And is Mrs May facing electoral disaster on this current course? Let me know what you think. If you think, no, it's OK, we need to stay with May, it'll all be OK, call 0345 6060 973. Or maybe you think, actually, what this polling is telling us is that there is real anger out there in the country, and unless they change either their leader or change course, they are headed for the rocks next time round, text to 84850. Or maybe you think, actually, these polls are all wrong, because ultimately, the first-past-the-post system will keep voters pretty much where they are, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC and uh, let's go straight to Daniel in Charles Hill and ask him, Daniel, good morning. Morning, Nigel. How are you? I am well. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by these figures. Um, I wonder, are, I mean, is it really possible that up to 40% of the electorate could vote for a new party that was explicitly anti-EU? Oh, absolutely. I think easily. Uh, Nigel, I cannot begin to tell you how betrayed I feel by Theresa May and this rotten Conservative government. I've, I've always voted Conservative, and this is actually nothing to do with Brexit, I must say. I could not believe when, when they came into government and they said the, the three things that they said that Theresa May during her campaign said, she said, we're going to ring fence the foreign aid budget. We're going to yeah. scrap the pledge not to raise income tax um, and two other taxes. Uh, they, start, they said, we're going to push through with the absolute colossal waste of money, HS2, over 100 billion pounds. We desperately need a new party. The Tories have betrayed, Conservatives have betrayed their own voters. And where's that party going to come from, Daniel? Well, I don't know, Nigel. Um, although, although I must say, I, I, I'm, you know, I, we do need someone who speaks common sense. And in fact, I want to start a political party called the Common Sense Party, a party of low... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel, I'm laughing. I'm laughing because um, I spent nearly a quarter of a century working with a brand new political party to try and get it to prominence in Britain. Daniel, do you, have you any idea how difficult it is to start a new party? Yes, of course. Well, the, the thing, the, the, the trouble is, Nigel, well, I think someone with your presence, and you know, you, you could well do it. Um, but I think the problem is that there are so many elected Conservative MPs, you know, like 300 or 200 or how many it is. Um, I think the problem is, that would be the problem, wouldn't it? Would be getting actual MPs of the Common Sense Party into Parliament. It's very, very difficult. You know, how do you break the first-past-the-post system? You see, in the past, people would say to me, oh, well, Nigel, I agree with you, 
But uh, I'm going to vote Conservative because I don't want to get let, let Labour in. And then I'd go to the Midlands or the North and they say to me, well, I agree with you, Nigel, but I've got to vote Labour, otherwise there'll be a Tory government. And what you tend to get, Daniel, with, you know, our first-past-the-post system is people vote for a party they dislike a little bit less than the other one. So there's, there's an awful lot of people out there voting for very negative reasons rather than going out and voting for what they believe in. Absolutely. And in fact, I was I was one of those people as well, Nigel. I thought I wasn't wild on Theresa May or even David Cameron and George Osborne. But I but I really disliked Gordon Brown and Tony Blair and what new new Labour did. Um, so I agree with you. But it's such a it's such a shame because the United Kingdom, Great Britain, we are such a fantastic country, as, as you often say, and you're quite right, we have the most amazing coastline, the most amazing villages, the most amazing people, the most amazing volunteers, and this government just seemed to be ignoring all of it. And it, it's just, uh, you know, they, they betrayed businesses with the business rates. Philip Hammond, who's been an appalling chancellor, betrayed businesses by not helping um, hundreds of thousands of businesses in the UK with the extortion of business rates, which has put a lot of businesses out of business, which people will see. Um, they're not conservative. What is going on? I, I wish this country deserves a political party that supports the amazing things that this country has. And we just, we don't have it, Nigel. And I, or, Daniel, I that- or, or could it be that if the Conservative Party was under different leadership, people like you wouldn't feel so betrayed? I mean, what did you make of Boris Johnson's resignation speech in the week? Um, well, I thought... Uh, Nigel, I've got to be honest with you. I, w- I used to be quite a big fan of Boris. I think he is just... I, I-, I was very disappointed with his resignation speech. I thought he was to- he's totally self-serving, totally selfish. I think Boris Johnson only thinks about Boris Johnson. And I think if he had come out, set, come out punching, saying, we're going to... We, I'm going to... You know, I'm going to come in lower taxes. I'm going to complete. I'm going to deliver Brexit. I'm going to, you know, I think he would have had a real chance. But Boris Johnson is only serves himself, I think. That's my view. Well, if he's only serving himself, why didn't he go in for the kill then? Well, that's a very good question, probably because I don't think he feels he he has enough support. Um, And I think if you look at his track record in London, I I don't think he he delivered enough in London. I don't think he delivered anything of any substance really in London. Closing fire stations and, you know, I I think it's a shame. I, I don't know... I, in fact, Nigel, you know, I, I follow politics very closely. I can't think off the top of my head of one person in the Conservative Party who I think, fantastic, this guy is going to come in, hold, you know, hold fast to traditional Conservative values, lower taxes, support business, local businesses, okay, you know, yep. small businesses. You know, do you know what I mean? I know I do. And uh, 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 Daniel, what you're saying is they're in real trouble. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Nigel, it's astonishing, I get by text, that after Brexit and Trump wake-up calls, our political class haven't even begun to realise how utterly disconnected they are from the realities of ordinary people, says Michael. Hi, Nigel. The Tories are bang in trouble as voters flee. If they betray Brexit, they are doomed, says Tony. Tony, I think you're right. Whether that means that people go to UKIP in large numbers or to a new party in large numbers, or whether, in fact, a lot of Tory voters just simply stay at home, I'm not sure. But, yep, they are in trouble on their current course. I genuinely do believe that. What does Ashley think? Who's calling from Caxton. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. I spoke to you a few weeks ago. Um, we were talking about blisters on my heels from um, campaigning for the um, Brexit vote. Yeah. Um, since I last spoke to you, um, Theresa May just seems to be going on a downward slide. Um, she was a Remain. She is a Remain. She wants us to remain deep down, I think. Um, in my opinion, I'm ready. I, I haven't even took part in the, in the YouGov poll, but I'm ready to back a new party. Um, the, only, the only saving grace I can see for the Tories is uh, Rhys Mogg. Rhys Mogg. So, yeah. so if, so if Rhys Mogg came in, Ashley, would your yeah, faith I, perhaps be restored in them? It would, yes, yeah. I, I, Theresa May's not going to restore my faith. Boris isn't either. Um, Rhys Mogg is where I'm at. I, I'd love to see him as the next Prime Minister, and I could probably back him, but um, other than that, I'm ready for a new party. I don't see the Tories under anybody else delivering what we what we earned. Uh, and actually, for you, how much of that is just about Brexit? It's all about Brexit. It's... it's, 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 it's I, 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 I've grown, I, was, I grew up before the EU became uh, the EU. Um, I was I was around. I wasn't able to vote, but I was around when there was all the um, Malay about um, we're joining the EEC, just a, a common market. Um, I've watched my whole from when I was a child. 
I was talking about the other day about the summer of '76 and uh, what a hot year it was, and we'd only just joined to this 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 band of corrupt people. But and then, now we and now we're trying to leave Ashley, and we've got a similar summer, haven't we? We have exactly, yeah. And <laughs> this is a this is a summer for change. It definitely is. And uh, as I've said before, I I am definitely in the camp of I I, I voted for the Tories because I thought they were going to deliver a better Brexit than uh, Labour. Yeah. And, uh, this, that just hasn't occurred, and it's not going to occur. I'm, I'm ready for change. I'm ready for a new party now. And, OK, uh, no, well, Ashley, if today's Sunday Times is right, you know, nearly 40% of the electorate are feeling the way that you're feeling. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Nigel, I agree. The political system is broken. I feel my vote counts for little. Too much party and not enough common sense. I want a politician who will consult their electorate and, where necessary, vote as directed says Alf in Halifax. Well, clearly, there are a lot of people out there feeling very, very unhappy. Is Theresa May doomed on her current course? You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's now 10.15. Well, before the break, we got Rhys Mogg's the man for me, but Kez in Dorset says, Rhys Mogg is even more disconnected than May. If he gets in charge, there's no hope for England. So, hey, there's always two points of view. But I'll tell you what, I've been saying for well over a year, that if Brexit is seen to be betrayed, there will be a backlash the likes of which the political class in this country simply cannot understand. Maybe, in the wake of the Chequers deal, it is beginning to happen. But Peter makes a point uh, by text that is one we tend to ignore. He says, I think unless Labour goes all out for Brexit, people may walk away from Labour. And Peter, you're right. The difference is, though, roughly 70% of Tory voters are committed Brexiteers whereas 70% of Labour voters seem to think we need to keep quite close to the European Union. So, But you're right, Peter, in areas like the Midlands, the north of England, South Wales, uh, there could well be that same cry of Brexit betrayal that we're hearing right now from so many Conservatives. So tell me, just how much trouble is Theresa May in? Is she doomed on her current course? 0345 6060 973. Let's go to Colchester and speak to Lawrence. Good morning, Lawrence. Good morning, sir. It is a privilege to talk to you. I'm well, a UKIP hey. member. Uh, I worship the ground you walk on. Now. Oh, goodness gracious me. Well, Lawrence, it's very sweet of you. Good morning. Um, so you're a, you're a UKIPper already, so you kind of probably were never that impressed with Mrs. May. Or were you briefly... After Lancaster no, House, no, thinking... No, I wasn't, no, I wasn't fooled by her at all. No way, not in a million years. She's a corporate lady. Uh, when she called that election last year, <clears throat> she was very lucky she never lost the election. Um, everybody in those countries in a mess, Nigel. And I've been trying to get through to you, sir, to come back to UKIP, and the people will flock to you, Mr Farage. Do you think so? I do, sir, with my hand on my heart. I am so disgusted with the way that the British people with your pink, blue, yellow, with white spots are being treated by the establishment. We need you back, Nigel, and I would... Yeah. ...come back to you, Kit, and you will pick this government apart. So what, Lawrence, I tell you what, hypothetically, right, hypothetically... Yeah. Let's say, let's, let, let's just say that I decide that um, I'll give my life up completely. I'll come I back know to... you've done a lot, I'll, Nigel. I no, 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 no just, just, just hear me out. I'll yeah. come back to UKIP, I'll give up life completely, I'll do it 24-7, I'll hate every minute of it, because it'll be loathsome. Um, I'll go into the next general election... It wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be that loathsome. Oh, yes, it would. Oh, yes, it would. Oh, yes, it would. Oh, yes, it would. Future Prime Minister, sir, you can't see it. But, but, it is right... But, but Lawrence, <laughs> but... But here's my point. Let's say I did all this. Let's say at the next election, you know, I led a party that got five and three quarter million votes and two yeah. seats and two seats. Yes, I know what you're saying. I know. What I, mean, I mean, this is that. this is the thing. Breaking the political system is really, really hard. And so when I, I see know, and, you, and you tried, Nigel. Oh, I, 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 I did try. I did try. Now, Lawrence, it yeah, could yeah. be. It could be. It could be. If yeah. these thirty-eight percent of people that are saying yeah. they really they really would vote for a Brexit party, if they did, then yeah. maybe maybe we're on the verge of the whole 
two-party yeah. system cracking. Maybe. Yeah, and I believe that. And Nigel, you've got to have more faith in people. I know you've been through the grinder, so we know that, and we appreciate what you've done. We can't put it into words for the normal working-class man and woman of this country, but you've got to come back. All right, Lawrence. No, I, I hear you loud and clear. Lawrence, I thank you. And again, you know, I get back to this. 38% of people say they might vote for a party, but they'll only do it in a general election if they think it's going to win a significant number of seats. Interesting. Brexit, Nigel, has been fantastic in educating ordinary people about politics. No longer will self-serving politicians get away with pulling the wool over the general public's eyes. Maybe you're right. I hope you're right. Uh, I'm not totally sure, though. However, in the midst of all of this, it's not all bad news for Theresa May because amongst Tory voters, 58% to 32% think she should fight on. So amongst Tory voters, still a majority think it's right to stick with Theresa May. I have to say, I don't believe that to be the case, but hey, what does Jim from Dartford make of it all? Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Nigel. I spoke to you a little while ago about I remember. Theresa May, and the, yes, um, and I said I had reservations, but in the main, I seemed to be think she was going along the right lines. Yeah. I took time out to try and read the white paper. Mm -hmm. I got part way through it, and I, for time constraints, I, I missed some of it out. But page ninety-three, paragraph forty-two, relates to the mechanisms for resolving disputes. Now I can either read that short paragraph out, or you can. Talk about it no, tonight. just 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 paraphrase, Jim. Okay. What you read into Basi that? Yeah, okay. Basically, the UK recognises the CJEU binds the EU on EU law, and um, if there's a dispute between the UK and the EU, there would be an arbitration panel or a joint committee. If yep. they can't solve it, they would re then go to the CJEU for their interpretation of it. But Jim, that can't be possible. Because Mrs. May, Mrs. May has said a thousand times, we're taking back control of our laws, our courts, and our borders. Well, well, partly one of the reasons I came on, because it's either my naivety or trust that led me the way I did. And this, this paragraph goes on to say, the joint committee or panel will have to resolve the dispute in a way that is, was consistent with the CJEU's um, interpretation. European Court, so that, yeah. For that meeting, for me, in one paragraph, page 93, paragraph 42 of the white paper, yep. tells me, forget it. Right, so... My or trust went the wrong way. So, right, so you were prepared to give her, as you say, with the last time you spoke to me, yes. prepared yeah. to give her the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Do you now think, Jim, she's been completely dishonest with you and, and with the British people? Well, when, when I heard that David Davis and Steve Brooks went to Chequers, um handed in their homework, and we said, oh, sorry, we don't need that now. I've got this. Yes, that there was... Bell. And that's why I was, had a determin t determination to at least have a look at this white paper. And so, Jim, paragraph, so, so Jim, paragraph. would you now say, would you now say, as a result of your investigations, that the Tories have lost your vote? They didn't have it anyway. Right, OK. This relates, the, this, this relates, all this relates to the common rule book that they keep talking, talking, talking about. Yeah. Well, it, 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 yeah, it was called regulatory alignment, but that sounded too horrible, so they've rebranded it as the common rule book, thinking we'll swallow it, no problem at all. Jim, thank you. Well, Jim there, doing some digging into the white paper, doesn't like what he sees. I get on Twitter, Theresa May is the most incompetent prime minister in my lifetime. Blair destroyed this country, but at least he was good at it. I will not be voting Conservative as long as she is in power. I am outraged by her Brexit proposals. Get her gone. Ooh, strong stuff for a Sunday morning. Let's go to Brighton and talk to Vicky. Good morning, Vicky. Hello, good morning, Nigel. Uh, we've spoken once before. Um, I remember. I thought you might be interested in listening to a couple of the extracts from the letter that I wrote to my local Conservative um, chairman. Yep. I'm a member of the party since I was uh -huh. 18. I voted oh, wow. Conservative, and I have a certain age now. And I would rather slash my wrists than ever vote for somebody like Jeremy Corbyn. So I think that I do reflect very well um, members of the party, and I think how they feel, having spoken to friends. Um, I've made the point in the letter, first of all, that I'm absolutely furious about the way um, Theresa May 
and the Cabinet have handled the preparation as well as the negotiations for leaving the EU. I've made the point that I don't refer to David Davis and those in his department and other honourable M- Conservative MPs who do understand the importance of honouring the vote of 17.4 million people. A couple of paragraphs that I think are, you know, relative. Um, I'm referring to the disgusting Remainer Conservative MPs, both inside and outside the Cabinet, who have given every impression of being hell-bent on trying to defeat the will of the people and are in cahoots with a wide range of so-called academics, experts, economists, and, of course, their campaigns being funded by money from big business. I'm sick to the back teeth of hearing from these same MPs and many others say that people like me who voted leave range from being deranged, stupid, wicked, racist, or at their most condescending, we didn't understand what we were voting for. Well, the many people I spoke to when campaigning came from a wide range of backgrounds and absolutely understood the key points of what leaving the EU meant. And many said that they'd been waiting for years to vote to make our country independent and sovereign again and not be dictated to by unelected people in Brussels. Neither am I personally a poor, misguided and ignorant leave voter, particularly as I've been a fellow of the Institute of Directors. I would therefore suggest that I know rather more about the strategy for needed for successfully negotiating big contracts by comparison with civil servant pen pushers led by Ollie Robbins, the majority of whom have fundamentally shown that they do not have the first idea on how to run a whelk stall, let alone negotiate on behalf of Great Britain Limited. Finally, I also think that everything that's come to light recently does not put the Prime Minister in a good light, as it would appear that yep. she has been undermining her own Brexit department for many months, and it is her checkers plan that has been worked on over a long period in secrecy. This is not leadership, it's frankly dishonest. So, no, Vicky, so, so Vicky, 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 so you are, you know, Tory all your life, but, but, and, and you're disgusted with what's happened, but what does it mean you're actually going to do? Well, I put the, the end of the letter, I have actually said that I'm going to maintain my membership for the simple reason that I think the opportunity to vote for a new leader is going to come sooner rather than later. So and you stick with happen. Mrs May, you stick okay. with Mrs May, and you'll still vote Conservative. Well, uh, well, this is the whole point, because I think there is going to be a leadership contest. I, I cannot believe in my bones that there isn't. That's the point. Now, whether it's going to come sooner or later, um, but, you know, what are the alternatives? And that's the problem. I mean, I did toy for a short period a few years back, and I think in the European elections I did vote UKIP, actually. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But what is the alternative? Because the point is, if, and you've said this morning quite rightly that there in fact is very 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 difficult for a new party it's you know it's much harder vicky than those 38 percent who told the sunday times they're prepared to vote for a new party it doesn't mean it's impossible and maybe we are on the edge of an electoral revolution but it's a bit harder than people think vicky thank you very much indeed and vicky in a sense with that phone call showing you how difficult it is to get really Radical change at UK politics. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It is now 10.30 and time for the... Well, 38% of voters say they'd like to vote for a party that believed in Brexit. There's a lot of talk of betrayal out there. I get by text, Brexit betrayal is now more than just failing to leave the EU. It's about a complete failure to believe in Britain and its people. Nigel, we may have a first-past-the-post system, but 17.4 million people voted leave. If one of the major parties were to commit to Brexit, the Remain vote would be split between the other two. That's interesting because 33% of people said they could vote for a new party that believed in staying in the European Union. Um, And it's rumoured that one of the reasons Sir Vince Cable wasn't in the House of Commons uh, for votes where where one might have expected him to be is that he is in negotiation about setting up a new centre party. Hmm, I'll believe it when I see it. But is UKIP, or UKIP that morphs into something else, is it potentially in a position here to make a dramatic breakthrough in this country? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. I, I think the anger is huge out there, and I do think that UKIP, or a party like UKIP, could get a huge number of votes at the next general election, but would it be enough? Would it be enough to break the mould, to coin a phrase from Roy Jenkins many years ago, of British politics? What is for certain is that if millions did leave the Conservative Party, uh, Mrs May would prove to be a great electoral dud. Is it too late for the Conservatives? Let's go to Jennifer, who's calling from Ealing. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning. 
Um, when Mrs May was first elected, let's face it, it was the best of a bad job. But I did really believe that she would try and do the best for the British people. But the longer it goes on, the more we see she is so ensconced with Europe that she'd rather do the best for them. And she uh, proposes to give away the fisheries, which was a, a good bargaining tool, £39 billion, pound, which actually they owe us because of our involvement well, during the war. Well, Jennifer, Jennifer, she... Um, I mean, there is perhaps talk, and we will, at the top of the hour, talk about the £39 because we are hearing some tougher talk now from Dominic Raab, the Brexit secretary. But, Jennifer, you've got to remember, 58% of Tory voters still think she's the right person to lead the party. Well, perhaps that 58% didn't actually want to leave um, Europe. And, and the, the, what? I think, personally, Philip what? Hammond is pulling her strings, the same what? as, as um, Alistair Campbell was pulling Tony Blair's. And I don't think the woman has got the backbone to do what the British people want because she's too... I'm worried about the, what big business try and tell her. Uh, we had all this scaremongering when we were going into the um, negotiation, you know, going into the vote. And I, I would, I've always voted um, in in latter years for you, regardless of whether I thought you'd get in or not, because I right. believe in this country. And the only person I would vote for again is either yourself or Jacob Rees Mogg. Other than that, I don't think. I will ever be casting a vote for anybody because... Well, I wonder about this, Jennifer. I wonder about this, you see, because a lot of people say, well, UKIP is going to sweep the board, etc. Uh, but it's not an easy thing to do. I wonder, Jennifer, whether really the biggest problem Theresa May faces is whether people just stay at home. Yeah, you're, you're probably right there. And to be quite honest, people sort of say, oh, we've got to vote because to keep Corbyn out. But if this government really mess up, they deserve everything they get. And if Corbyn gets in, then so be it. And, and I mean, it will ruin the country. We all know that. Every time a Labour government cut gets in, it ruins the country. Well, well, that's your opinion. Something, I mean, some would say, Jennifer, Labour government gave us the NHS. Um, yes, many years ago when Labour meant Labour. Labour doesn't mean what it, it was f first set out to do. Labour has lost its way over the years and it's become almost a communist party and Tony Blair became a conservative party virtually. <laughs> well, it did pretty much go that way, didn't it? Jennifer, thank you. Jennifer, a lot of people like Jennifer may be staying at home. Um, I don't know, and I'm particularly keen to know about UKIP. I mean, clearly it's difficult for me to talk about UKIP in a completely dispassionate way. Um, I do think UKIP could pick up a lot of votes at the next election, but can it? Is it possible that UKIP could make a breakthrough? I don't know. Tell me what you think. 0345 6060 973. Let's go to Steve in Great Dumbo. Steve, good morning. Hi, Nigel. Hi. Um, I think that, I think I agree with all of what you've said, obviously. Um, I think the problem we've got is, um, yes, we know if the Tory party continues down the road it's going with Brexit, we know it's going to be destroyed in the next election. You think but so, yeah? Mean, well, come on. Um, it's obvious, it's obvious, but, but what the problem's going to be is if we're not out properly of the common market, which we won't be, if they get destroyed in the elections, the problem is you're going to get a, a Liberal Labour alliance that will keep us in. That's the problem we've got. Well, we may, if things, if things stay on course, Steve, have left the treaties on the 29th of March next year. That would at least be a step in the direction you want, wouldn't it? Well, it would be, but it doesn't mean, you know, we're, we're only out when we're out, Nigel, and it's, that's the important point. We need to be out properly, a 100% break. Otherwise, there's always a chance we could get back in. You know, that, that, that's how it works. We, joined the, we never joined the common market. We just woke up one morning and found we were members of it under Ted Heath. And, and there's a lot of there's a lot of, of um, conspiracy theories aligned to that, um, and, and you can hit, you can read that in Michael Shrimpton's, Shrimpton's book. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Steve, there are always conspiracy theories about absolutely everything. Uh, the fact is, we did join the EEC, and it was done by a vote of Parliament, and the referendum, of course, came later. But Steve, you know, I mean, you're somebody clearly that desperately wants Brexit. Do you think Mrs May is the right leader to take us there? Absolutely not. We won't get Brexit with her. We will not get Brexit with her. 
Michel Barnier is, is, is a very skilled man, and he's not going to barge an inch. And it's, it's going to be watered down more and more and more and more. And, and, and that, we need Jacob Rees Mogg, you know, uh, um, you know, or, or, or you. But the, the, the problem, I agree. The problem is, you know, you're not a Charles de Gaulle. You're not going to be able to come back the, the way he could because of the way the politics works. And it's you could you could get eight million votes and, and, and twenty seats. I mean, it's 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 you know, it's very very difficult to break into politics. Very difficult. I think it's a lot. Know. It's a lot harder, Steve, than many many than many people realise. Steve, thank you very much indeed for your call. Well, thirty eight percent of you in the Sunday Times poll say that you're prepared to vote for a party that clearly stands for Brexit, and it sounds a dramatic headline figure. And there is huge anger out there in the country, particularly at this moment in time amongst Conservative voters, but are they really, are they really going to shift in sufficient numbers as an election to see something dra really dramatic change in British politics? I do, I have to say, have my doubts. Maybe that's because I'm slightly jaundiced by my previous attempts to break the system. Um, let's go to Howard, who's calling from Hastings. Good morning, Howard. Good morning, Nigel. Um, it's good to speak to you again. Good to speak to you. So, um, Howard, are these? I mean, do you honestly think these opinion polls are right? Could nearly. Um, I don't know I about mean, that, but I wanted to yeah. say something very important to you. I really Go think on. it's important we get this right as a country. We can't mess this up. In, in order to save us from having perpetual centrist, centrocratic government forever, and to give the British people the chance to choose genuine ideological parties on either side, we need a national coalition headed by Jacob Rees-Mogg and Jeremy Corbyn. That's the solution, because then you can say, you can put away the partisan stuff on either side, and you'll say, we're not going for a left-wing Brexit, or, or a right-wing Brexit, which would just benefit the city. We're just going to go for Brexit and get it done. And then once that's done, then the public can choose to elect a government led by somebody like Rees-Mogg, or a government led by somebody like Corbyn, who's more of a traditional Labour Party person. But and Jeremy then, Corbyn, people Howard... People can see coming through the middle across the dispatch box, common sense, as the two parties argue, like it used to work in this country. And instead, what we have now is Blairites, Mayites, and centrist centrocrats, and we're going to have that forever, unless we get out of Europe. But there's no way the Parliamentary Labour Party would let Jeremy Corbyn do that, is there? I know there's not, and I know it can't happen. I just, I, I know, well, when I say can't, it would be almost impossible. But, I mean, I, I think it would work. I know they won't let it. I, I know the, the Parliamentary Labour Party wouldn't let that happen. And I can understand why they wouldn't. But I, I think it might bring to... We have a slight majority of people in this country who, who favoured leaving. Um, I'm one of them. Admittedly, it was quite small, but going by the, the, you know, what we've done for centuries, when a referendum is taken, if the referendum is won, we follow that. Now, therefore, we would need to unite people. We would need to re, um, unite the, 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 the left-wing Brexiters and the right-wing Brexiters. That's going to be essential. Um, that I think a national... I mean, I said right from the start we needed a national government, and I actually put my head in my hands as soon as it didn't mm. happen. I tried yep. to get onto Nick Ferrari that day, and I was ringing and ringing, and the ring was, why the hell aren't we, we looking at a national government? Well, how, how Howard, I have to say, have I have to say, Howard, I think in many ways you're right, but I think there is absolutely zero chance of it happening. And I think you accept that too, don't you, really? I do think that sadly is the case. I don't know what we're going to do from here. I think it, I'm, I'm very concerned about, about what's going to happen. Uh, uh, very. <laughs> do you think maybe, I mean, maybe, Howard, it's such a mess, maybe there will be a general election this autumn? I think it's highly likely there will be a general election, but there's just too many, I mean, you, there's, there's too many um, factions within the traditional British parties, which we had. We used to have a traditional Conservative party. I mean, you've almost, I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg is almost an anti-establishment high Tory, in a sense. He, he's not which is a very strange concept, isn't it, really? It, 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 it is kind of, but he wasn't part of that counter-revolution sort of which changed the Conservative Party, which is very much goes hand in glove with the EU. I mean, I'm surprised so many people think that this type of Conservative Party we have today would get them out of the EU. I mean, the two go together like cheese and pickle. I mean, it's deluded. <laughs> um, and more people seem to care about the interests of the continuation of that defunct Conservative Party than actually leaving the EU. But Jacob Rees-Mogg is, is kind of a, a one-off. He's kind of an eccentric, um, and his pol political philosophy does seem to Jacob, removed Jacob the... eccentric? I wonder whether people who listened to Jacob on LBC yesterday thought he was eccentric. Maybe they did. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Howard, thank you. And Howard's call for national unity, not likely to be listened to by our politicians any time soon. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's now 10.45.
Is Mrs. May headed for electoral disaster? As 38% of people say they could back a new Brexit party. Gosh, if 38% of people actually did vote for a new Brexit party, maybe they'd be the biggest party in Parliament. But is that realistic in a first-past-the-post electoral system? Are we on the edge of an electoral revolution or not? Well, there's a lot of anger out there, huge amount of anger out there. I just wonder whether there's enough to break the system. I'm not convinced. Patrick is calling from Aberdeen. Good morning, Patrick. Morning, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. So, what do you make? What do you make of these polls this morning, Patrick? Well, you know, I, um, uh, it's hard for me to kind of um, understand that the, the 30 percent of the people are, are really looking for a hard Brexit. Uh, and aren't happy with uh, the way that the Tory party has guided us in the last couple of weeks. For me, uh, not being a Tory voter at all, I think that uh, that, that May is trying to uh, lessen the damage uh, that could be potentially inflicted on our country by a hard Brexit, and I think that that's only a good thing. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, Patrick, isn't it? Because it's the European question, of course, that has caused the SNP so much harm in Scotland, isn't it? Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, w w w there, there has been a couple of seats lost, uh, potentially because of a, a new independence referendum, um, which was hinted at because of the way that the Brexit uh, referendum went. Um, but uh, r realistically, I think that this, the support for the SNP is, is almost as strong um, uh, as it was in the past. Uh, and uh, with the potential of a hard Brexit gaining, uh, we'll become only stronger. Um, and, well, uh, well, 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 Patrick. But Patrick, you say that, but isn't it really interesting that that you know both the last two leaders of the SNP are very, very committed to the European project, and yet a third of SNP voters voted Leave. Yeah, well, that that might be the case, um, but I can't say that I agree with the the third of the, the SNP voters that, 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 that voted Leave. I think that uh, being a member of the the, the the largest single market in the world, um, with four percent of the UK's GDP uh, being derived from it, um, is uh, 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 far outweighs um, the the possibilities of leaving. Um, so we we better join the euro then, Patrick, hadn't we? Well, I don't think that, well, you know, given the Brexit referendum and the way that it went, if we were to leave the EU and then possibly come back into the EU in a future date, for example, if Scotland went independent and then rejoined the EU, then that may, that may well have to happen. Um, but we'll, we'll see, and that's why I think um, it's uh, you know, a hard time. And Do you know, Patrick, money, uh, I think, I think it was... In the first place. I think it was the prospect of having to join the Euro above everything else that cost Alex Salmond that referendum on separation back in 2014. But you see, this is um, where I have to disagree that uh, I don't think that we were going to be railroaded into joining the euro in the, in the way and our membership and the way that our membership was in the past. Uh, and I think that, that you and uh, uh, a number of other Leave campaigners uh, have deliberately twisted the facts, pushed, uh, uh, pu pushed uh, non Oh, no. Like Turkey oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, pa oh, Pat so Pat Patrick, Patrick. Are, are Patrick, I sit next. I sit next to Jean-Claude Juncker. He wants a European army. He wants a foreign policy without any nation state having a veto. He wants everyone to join the euro. I mean, they want a United States of Europe, Patrick. I mean, why, are we, why do we run away from this when it's clearly the truth? So they want a United States of Europe, but they were happy for uh, the UK to retain uh, the Great British Pound. And the, and the, no, they weren't happy at all. They, they well, weren't happy at all. They would have been happy continuing with the status quo had we not had the Brexit referendum. Um, uh, and, you, and you're saying also that we're going to um, give all of our army over to the European army. Is that the case? Is, uh, are we not oh, well, going to have a national army at all? Or no, I mean, to contribute uh, no. to the UN? Well, we have, obviously we have NATO, uh, where we commit national forces. But, but the, point I'm making, Pat, the point I'm making, Patrick, is that the European Union is heading for deeper centralisation. And isn't that, in a way, why the politics of Italy, the politics of Sweden, the politics right across Europe is changing, and Eurosceptic parties virtually everywhere are on the rise? 
I, I think it was an over exaggeration by uh, the Leave side, and I still believe that that uh, re- UK would not have been railroaded into the Euro. We wouldn't be railroaded into committing our armed forces to only a European army. Um, uh, and the way that we had it in the, in the past, we weren't in the Schengen area, um, so we didn't really have borderless, uh, uh, you know, n- no control well, over our borders. Well, we well, you, well you had to show well, a pass. Admit it, admit it, Nigel. No, 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 <laughs> com- total free movement of people, but you have to flash a passport at somebody as you walk past. Yes. Anyway, okay. pa- but, 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 but Patrick, that, these are the arguments That's of the referendum. You flash a you passport know, you know. means put the passport into a scanner uh, uh, and bring up any warrants, uh, criminal activity from the person, uh, uh, and, and that's all at risk of, of being lost by leaving the EU. Patrick, would you, would you maybe be one of the 33% who would contemplate voting for a new party that was committed to staying in? Uh, Yes, I'm, to be honest, being from Aberdeen, uh, I'm quite happy with where my vote is at the moment, with the SNP, and, and, and I will continue to vote SNP as long as this Brexit charade continues, uh, or a hard Brexit charade continues. I, I well, think I mean, it really is potentially I d- damaging to... to, to I didn't to hear the term hard... Nobody told me the terms hard Brexit and soft Brexit during the referendum. Well, they were certainly discussed afterwards. Oh, yeah, because the Remainers and the establishment want to paint the concept of us becoming an independent country as being a bad idea. Okay, so what was your understanding of what was on the ballot paper? We when voted, we, we voted to, to, to leave. The EU, yes, what to leave. Mean to leave the EU? It means you leave the European Union, you leave politically. We voted for independence. This was the real independence referendum we voted to become independent which means we leave it and we leave and we leave the associated parts of it i mean it couldn't really be clearer could it okay is the eu part of the same body as uh, uh belongs or is, is is the overarching body for the single market the customs union well they are all parts of the eu's legal order we voted to leave the lot it's very simple yeah. i mean you can disagree with it you can disagree yeah. with it, Patrick. As a decision, you can disagree with it economically. You can disagree with it, you know, politically and say it's not what you want. But I thought it was clear. Patrick, I'm going to move on. Thank you. I'm going to go to Chris in Hereford. Chris, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Yes, it's absolutely perfectly clear what people voted for, um, yeah. as, we're, as I'm finding out every day. Um, but uh, new, new parties and um, uh, you know, UKIP revivals and so on are, are, are something for the future. We've got to look at the now. And now we've got the frightening prospect of a government that can't deliver the mandate that the people gave it. And it's not who leads it, it's, it's the party itself that they've got a, sp- a fatal flaw, as they have done ever since we joined uh, the, the common market, that, 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 they're, that, they're, they're on, that they're two parties, basically, on that issue. So it's not yeah. who leads it, it's the parties themselves. So you've got the Tory party split on the European Union, you've got the Labour party split on the European Union, a big chunk of the SNP, as I just, I just pointed out to our Aberdeen caller who feel differently, maybe the answer, Chris, is a complete realignment of British politics along Brexit lines. Uh, t- totally, and, uh, but, but of course we haven't, got, we haven't got time for that. So uh, for the time being, I mean, I've just started a campaign called Herefordshire for Brexit, which right. is a non-party political campaign, uh-huh. but basically aimed at putting pressure on our local MPs to say, this is what we voted for, we knew what we were voting for, we expect you as our MPs to deliver it, purely and simply. Well, think, Chris, we are, they, are, are they answering your emails and letters? Uh, they, they visited our stand in the town centres, yes, and they've been given the message uh, loud and clear. OK, OK. Well, well, I, well, Chris, I hope they listen to you. I hope they listen to you. But I hope they listen to you, but I'm not sure they were. Chris, I'm going to move on. A few messages. Robin Manchester says, Nigel, you and UKIP have caused enough damage to the country. Please don't come back. Um, Jackie says, UKIP will not do well unless it ups its game on Twitter. The Tories won't get my vote again if they muck up Brexit, says Ian. A lot of people, Ian, in that camp. And I would welcome a moderate new party. I have no one who represents me. So, you know, all sides of this potential for change. There's more anger on the Brexit side than there is on the Remain side these days. Now, interestingly... Britain will refuse to pay the £39 billion divorce bill to Brussels if the European Union fails to agree a trade deal, the new 
Brexit Secretary pledges today. Dominic Raab told the Sunday Telegraph that he would make the vast payment formally conditional on the EU fulfilling its side of the bargain. Are you impressed with this language from the new Brexit Secretary? Do you think maybe he's just being damn rude? In which case, call 0345 6060 973. Maybe you think, actually, he doesn't mean it. Text to 84850. Or maybe he's the new Brexit hero. In which case, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. Well, Dominic Raab, youngish MP, undoubtedly very capable, very able, uh, and a prominent campaigner, and a very effective campaigner, I think, in many ways for Brexit, all of which surprised a lot of people that after uh, the Chequers Accord, and of course we saw David Davis resign, and Steve Baker go with him, and then we saw Boris give the big resignation speech, and, you know, several people uh, since then trickling out of the government saying it's not good enough, saying it's a sellout, comparing the Lancaster House speech and the language that Theresa May used with the Chequers Accord and Boris, I think, quite effectively in that resignation speech, pointing out just how much we'd watered down Brexit. So it was a big surprise, I think, to many, many people that Dominic Raab decided to take the role of Brexit Secretary. How on earth uh, could he accept the Chequers Accord and since he took the job, he's explained that he thinks the arbitration model for resolving trade disputes is satisfactory. Although we had a caller, Jim, from Dartford on this morning saying, if you read the document, actually, ultimately, um, if arbitration isn't met, it will be the European Court of Justice that finally decides. But Rob clearly has convinced himself that it's the right job to take, and he thinks the Chequers deal is acceptable. Well, against that, He's now come out with some really pretty tough language because he said that we will not be paying the 39 billion sterling divorce bill unless the European Union fulfills its side of the bargain. Now, some people have said to me, um, oh, actually, this was the case all along. You know, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But the reality of this uh, is that no one's talked about it for weeks or indeed even months is this folks is this the kind of language that you want to hear do you want to hear the brexit secretary saying listen you lot start honoring your side of this bargain and if you don't do so you ain't going to get our money is that kind of language useful or does it actually just make monsieur barnier dig his heels in even deeper Tell me what you think. Is this the language you want to hear from the Brexit Secretary? And if you think, no, it's damn rude, then call 0345 6060 973. Or maybe you think, hooray, at last, somebody is standing up for our national interest. And if that's how you feel, then text to 84850. Or maybe you think, actually, we're wasting our time. Doesn't matter what we say, Monsieur Barnier won't listen anyway. And if you think that... Please, t please, 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 you can uh, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. So here's, here is Dominic Raab explaining his position on The Andrew Marr Show this morning. I'm striving every sinew with our department, with Michel Barnier, who I think is a man that wants to do a deal with us, tremendous pressures on his side, to get the best deal. But we've got to... I think it's the only the responsible thing to do to be prepared if those negotiations and the energy and the ambition and the pragmatism we're showing are not reciprocated. So that's the responsible thing to do, whether it's the allocation of money, preparation of our treaty relations, we're hiring extra border staff, and I think people need to know that actually we're ready so that Britain can thrive whatever happens. So that's what I want to ask you about. Can I ask about the situation, for instance, of the 300,000 British citizens living at the moment in Spain? The week after a no-deal situation, what would be their legal position? Well, look, as I said to you before, we've got the position in place with the, uh, and actually on the withdrawal agreement, which deals with the rights of EU nationals mm -hmm. here, UK expats abroad, we've come to an agreement on all of that. Now, But the withdrawal agreement falls under these no, circumstances. it does, but actually there's quite a lot of preparation and planning that's been placed. We've got clear options. We will not do anything which will create um, uh, insecurity um, and we'll do everything we can to mitigate the potential uh, disruption. And what we're going to be doing over the summer, which is, I think, new and over 
over the following months is releasing a series of technical notices which for both businesses but also some of the citizens including those that you've mentioned be very clear about what they should do and what we're doing on their behalf well you know he's also saying no deal is still a possibility though i do not believe that with theresa may as prime minister but hey maybe i'm wrong so is this slightly tougher line that we're not paying away 39 billion unless they give us a proper sensible trade deal is that the language that you want to hear are you impressed with the new brexit secretary or do you think frankly he's just a careerist uh, who's taken a position that runs contrary to what he campaigned for in the referendum, and he's now just trying to dress it up a little bit. Andrew is calling from Belfast, where, of course, you've had the Prime Minister visiting, Andrew, haven't you? We have done, yes, recently. And actually, my call is about how uh, Dominic Raab is speaking a bit tougher, and for a long time, I felt we should have been a lot tougher. I'd never understood from the start why we went into negotiations and said we want something. We should have said we are leaving, and it's now up to you. And the second point I have is really on the EU stance with the Northern Irish and Irish border. Yeah. We have allowed the EU to dictate to us that if there is a border, there will be violence. Now, no one in Northern Ireland is saying there'll be violence if the camera goes up or if there's a few cars stopped. The only people who say that are extremists and terrorists. And what the EU are doing is they're inciting that violence by giving it a justification. They're literally telling terrorists, it's okay for you to start that again. Andrew, 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 can you get, can you get out of the wind ever so slightly? It's, it's sounding a bit... Uh... Hello? I do apologise that I'm outside. Right, that's better. Can um, better now? I can. But Andrew, so we did have some violence, didn't we, last week in Londonderry or Derry, however you choose to call it. I mean, is it, is it possible... Uh, that we are on the verge in Northern Ireland of of of, of troubles uh, sparking again. But that violence is being justified. So that violence in London area, as I would call it, was caused by residents at the bogside during marching period. Now the marching period is a celebration of our union with Britain, and what happens there is people who dislike it try to disrupt it, and that flared up a bit in that area because people didn't decide to stay away from it. Who disliked it, they decided to get involved and become violent. Now, that wasn't violence that we would have seen in the past in terms of bombing and guns and so forth. Mm -hmm. The violence that the EU are suggesting that will happen if there is a camera or if a few trucks are stopped is yeah. the IRA will start a campaign of murder. Which, surely, my, which uh, surely is ludicrous, isn't it? It is incredible to allow them to say that. And my suggestion to Dominic, Dominic Raab is that we should be taking a stronger point and calling them out of that. Why are they inciting this violence? Yeah, I agree. I agree. No, I agree. I agree. It, it, it is Monsieur Barnier who has done his utmost to make the Irish border a problem, isn't it? It is. And it isn't even a problem. There's a border there. I travel across it. I've been stopped before, you know, once or twice for random checking. It's yeah. not a problem. We can still do business. We are happy with Brexit in general. Um, my big problem is we, we as a government, or the British government, I, I consider myself very much British, uh -huh. We are not standing up to the EU and saying, don't pander to terrorists. You but are allowing does... them to feel like they're in the right if they start being violent again, when they're not. They're so so would you right. like to hear, would you like to hear Dominic Raab, having started off talking about, you're not getting our money unless we get a deal, would you like to hear, hear him addressing this issue too about the Irish border? I would like him to stand up to them and say it is completely unacceptable. I'd love, do you know what, violence. Andrew? I'd love him to. I bet he won't, but I'd love him to. Andrew, thank no, you. Well, I, no, thank you. Got to move on. I get from Linda on Twitter. Rob has sold his soul to support this lousy checkers deal. No confidence in him whatsoever. It's not rude. It's a negotiating position. They want our money, and they're not going to get it for nothing. Dave says, yes, very impressed. A minister with a backbone. Hmm. Not sure. I believe it, though. It's funny, isn't it? Our confidence in our political leaders, has it ever been lower? Let's go to Robin, who's calling from Spofforth in West Yorkshire. Good morning, Robin. Spofforth near Harrogate in North Yorkshire, if I may correct you, Mr. Farage. Good morning. Oh, gosh. Oh, well, if I get the geography wrong, I apologise. Hands no, up. Nothing, don't Hands up. R Robin from near Harrogate in North Yorkshire. Uh, tell me. Right. Is, is this language from Rob? Do you think this signifies a tougher negotiating position or is he doing it just to kind of dampen down those who say he sold out to this lousy checkers deal i'm not an economist mr 
Farage, so correct me if I'm talking nonsense, but it could be a masterstroke. Okay. The EU, when we finally leave, we are the second biggest net contributors, we leave a huge hole in their fiscal budget. The 39 billion could be a nice little earner to get them over the transition period until they sort their own budgets out, perhaps asking the Germans, the French and the Dutch to pay more to support all the other nations. So perhaps this threat of 39 billion might just concentrate Mr. Barnier's mind. And I think if the threat is credible, if it's believable, I think perhaps we should have done that a long time ago. Well, Robin, a lot of people would agree with that. Uh, No, absolutely. It's funny, you know, with the money. I mean, the UK leaving, voting to leave, uh, one of the biggest countries, one of the biggest economies in the European Union is leaving. And yet, did they cut the budget, Robin? No, they did not. So uh, they do need the money. And yeah, I mean, if they really believe we're just not going to pay any more money, it might concentrate their minds. It might, as you say, possibly be a masterstroke. Do you think that Rob is saying this with conviction, Robin? I think he may be a career politician. He may be seizing this opportunity. He may be looking forward to years in advance. Um, I can't believe a Secretary of State could make a statement like that without authority from number 10. So I believe this is credible, and I think it's what a lot of people, myself included, who voted for Brexit for all the right reasons, for our sovereignty, for the, for the independence of our judiciary, not being controlled by five unelected presidents and vice presidents, uh, commissioners setting the political agenda given to them. By, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all those things I voted for. But probably, I believe, it could be coming down at the end of the day to just money. When okay. we leave... The second biggest contributor. Yeah, no, no, it matters. Garage. What are the EU going to do? Where are they going to plug the hole with that money? Well, they've just um, announced a fine on Google of five billion. Uh, but you're right. We're talking here about forty billion. It's big money. Robin, I thank you very much indeed. And a lot of you will be saying, does this signify a new, tougher negotiating position, or is it Theresa May and Dominic Raab really just trying to pull the wool over our eyes because they know how really, really upset? Tory leave voters are over the Chequers deal. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's now 11.15. The new Brexit secretary starts to talk tough and says, you're not getting our 39 billion unless you give us a proper trade deal. Is this, does it mark a new departure in our talks with the European Union? Are we going to get tougher? Or is it, frankly, just a careerist con? Because they know how really, really upset and unhappy so many millions of Conservative voters are about the Chequers deal and the way that she's handling Brexit. And just to be helpful, former Prime Minister Sir John Major has been on the television this morning telling us that a second referendum is morally justified because the Leave campaign made a number of fantasy promises. Well, he would know all about those. Let's listen to John Major on the Andrew Marr programme this morning. If the House of Commons continues to be deadlocked, if uh, the irreconcilables remain unmovable, and the whips of the other parties decide to take political advantage of the government's uh, voting weakness in the House of Commons, if they decide to do that and put party politics before the national interest, then there is a possibility of the Commons being unable to reach an agreement and a general election ultimately becoming unavoidable. I would hope not. It would be a very unpleasant general election if we had it. This campaign, the referendum campaign, and afterwards, frankly, has not been a glorious episode in uh, British constitutional history. It's been very ugly with many of the things that have been said, particularly, if I may say so, about the uh, small number of Remain MPs in the Conservative Party who, to my mind, have been extraordinarily brave and have been insulted uphill and down dale because they have expressed their concern 
for what will happen to our country yes. if we go down the Brexit route. So, well, I mean, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg has said that this is all just embittered uh, bile from a, from, from a failed prime minister in, in, your, in your terms. I think he said it even worse than that, but I won't read the entire quote out. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't read very carefully what uh, Mr. Rees-Mogg says, but I believe he said something like that. Mm. Uh, it was very statesmanlike. Oh, good old John Major. Isn't it great to see him back on the scene? It's terrible, he says, that Remain supporting Tory MPs have been insulted. How awful. And this from the Prime Minister, who called members of his own cabinet, who were leading in 1992 to the year of record business bankruptcies and record house repossessions. But the establishment never change. It doesn't matter. How much of a disaster our engagement with the European project is, they stick to it, and boy, he is sticking to it. I'm sorry to quote the Prime Minister and use that word on a Sunday morning, but I just find it a bit rich for him, of all people, to talk about insults. Let's get back to Dominic Raab. Tony, pretty sceptical. He says to me on Twitter, let's not forget the language Theresa May used in the beginning. Raab is pretending to stand up for Britain, to take the pressure off the Conservatives. I trust him as much as I trust Tony Blair. Nigel, what is missed? We would be paying £39 billion for the Chequers deal. Well, Philip, uh, this is the point. You know, I, I, I seems to me that with Theresa May as Prime Minister, we're going to pay this money anyway, and all this talk of a no-deal Brexit, well, I don't believe it as long as she is Prime Minister, some of you may think that's a very good thing. Let's go to Brian in Harrow. Brian, is this language now from Dominic Raab, is it helpful or not? No, I just, just want to make a quick comment before I say it. Sure. I spoke to you the first day we actually came out of the EU, or supposed to on paper, Nigel, a couple yep. of years ago now. Yep. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. And since then, it's gone downhill rapidly, basically. It, and listening to John Major made me puke. That whinging, I, I, I could swear on it, I would. But he's just an old whinger who's got all the accoutrements of being an ex-Prime Minister, probably be, being driven around in a car by the taxpayer still because he's an ex-Prime Minister. But let's get back to the point. This thing that Dominic Rav has come out with now is, is the 12th hour. It's miles too late. It should have been done at the beginning. I, I'm not, I've never been a, a negotiator of that degree, but I negotiated on a massive company for a union a long time ago, and I was a right-wing union officer, not a lefty. And you don't go in and lay all your cards on the table for the enemy to, to hammer you into the ground, do you? I mean, that's what we did. We should have gone in and said we're not paying any money at all until we get some form of agreement. We did the opposite. We said, here's the money. Now we well, can sort out the agreement. Isn't that because, Brian, she, she has been, throughout this, Theresa the appeaser. Happy well, to appease Monsieur Barnier at every twist and turn. Well, listen, when she set up her government after the election, which was a disaster, most of them are Remainers, aren't they? She should have set it up with leavers, basically. As soon as she did that, I knew that it was... In my opinion, I mean, I'm getting, old, I'm getting on a bit now, Nigel, and I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, to be quite... I'm getting really worried, to be honest. Well, a lot of people are, Brian, and maybe that's why in the previous hour we discussed the fact that nearly 40% of the electorate would consider, you know, voting for a new or an existing proper Brexit party. Brian, I thank you for your call. Now, my next caller, this is pretty odd, um, my next caller is calling from Botswana. It's Dallas, a new caller to this show. Dallas, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Right, so you listen from Botswana, do you? I certainly do. I have you on, I have you on my computer at home and on my, on, my, <laughs> uh, on my phone when I'm driving around. Fantastic. So how does... The Brexit process and the new Brexit secretary look from Botswana. Well, as far as I can, tell, as far as I can see it, from my point of view, Dominic, Dominic Raab is a is a Theresa May appointee. Yeah. Um, she's one of his cho her chosen her chosen ones, um, and he's going to Brussels to carry out the the Chequers Accord, which wasn't an accord in any way, shape, or form. So I don't think waving this through a thirty nine million pound threat is going to achieve anything. Billion, it's, billion, it's, billion, it's, Dallas, it's, it's billion. <laughs> yeah, it's well... A billion, a bigger pardon. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, a billion here, a billion there, and soon we're talking real money, Dallas. Um, but but yes. isn't, it, isn't it all a bit late? I mean, haven't we 
haven't we as a British government, from the very beginning of this process, sort of lain down, prostrate on the floor? It's a bit late to get up and start fighting, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. I love your, I love your Theresa the Appeaser, by the way. It's, it's well, it, well, it rather sums it up for me, you know. And, and it does. It does. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, and I've wanted to say this for a long time. Um, you know Brussels, you know the EU from the inside out, whereas everybody else who's negotiating knows it from the outside in. Yep. And it is completely beyond my ken why you were not in, appointed as a special advisor, as a minister without oh. portfolio, as some sort of some sort da of title. Dallas, I would, I would love to, it I would love to have helped. I would love to have helped, but this Conservative government, I mean, you know, they'd rather I just left the country, let alone get involved in their negotiations. They loathe me, Dallas. They'll always loathe me. They did not want to have this referendum, and they feel that I forced it upon them, and that's the real truth of it. Dallas, I thank you very much indeed for your long-distance call. Thank you. Nigel, I think the £39 billion by Raab is used as a diversion to get the Chequers white paper past us, says Sheila. Sheila, you are a very, very deeply cynical lady, and I think you're probably right. Nick is calling from Croydon. Good morning, Nick. Uh, hello, Nigel. Morning to you. Good morning. I realise it's all very late for uh, the British government to to uh, talk tough about this, or actually set out their stall in yep. some robust manner. But nevertheless, at least they are doing it now, and would like to 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 hope they actually follow it through. We'd like a deal with the EU. We'd like a deal with the EU which suits both ourselves and them. But that requires the EU coming to the party as well. And if we can't uh, get the EU to actually talk sensibly about it, we leave. It's that simple. And any negotiations, you know, should really should be beyond that basis. Do I don't you think see any but, any problem here? But do you think, Nick, you know, having spent a couple of years of saying yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, Mister Barnier. Do you actually think after two years of this, he's even going to believe we're on the verge of getting tough? Um, we are where where we are. Okay, we we may have may have faltered over over the past couple of years. We have to put that in the past where 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 yeah. it is. They'll soon find out we are serious if if we start behaving seriously behind our talk. So we might as well start now. So we it's okay. Where so we it, are. So it's a case, Nick, really, what you're saying is better late than never, really, isn't it? Quite so. Exactly so. Hmm. I wonder. And where do you, Nick, where do you see, where do you think this whole Brexit process is going to end up? The political classes, in my view, in this country, are trying to uh, stop, stop it. And they're trying, they're fighting tooth and nail. It goes across every political party, the Labour Party as much as, much as the, uh, the, uh, our uh, Conservative Party. There is a desperation amongst our political classes to stop the Brexit going going through, and I think it is utterly disgraceful. Well, that's I, certainly what John Major appeared to be doing this morning, wasn't it? Just in just in Greening the other day, you know, talking about a uh, referendum on the deal, and which is a uh, fine in itself, but then she, she spoils it with a third option, staying in the EU. And that tells you everything you need to know about what she actually wants, to stay in the EU. We were categorically told the decision would be ours. We were mm. categorically mm. told the decision would be implemented by the, the, the uh, yeah. uh, government. I we know. were categorically told there wouldn't be another question put to us for a generation. And they wonder why we're angry, Nick. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's, um, when, when, Nick, uh, Nick, government... Nick, you, Nick, you're not alone. I've got to move on. I thank you for your call, your comments, your passion. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive on LBC. It is now 11.30. And Dominic Rubb says, you're not getting our 39 billion unless you give us a trade deal. Is this the kind of language that we need to hear? Should we have been doing this for the last two years? Is it too late? Has Theresa, the appeaser, with her approach, made them think they can walk all over us, whatever we do? And against that backdrop, John Major now saying a second referendum would be entirely 
justified. Alan on Twitter makes a really good point. He says, why do all the Remainer MPs keep going on about democracy when all they want to do is stop the biggest vote ever in British history? Alan, that is a fair point. But they would say, ah, but the point is, inaccuracies, untruths were told to the British people and probably the whole thing was funded by the Russians. That at least is what some of them seem to believe. Nigel, to be fair, you said yourself before the referendum that if it was close in favour of Remain, that you would fight tooth and nail, true or not true. I said before the referendum, if it was 52-48 the other way, there would be some, particularly in the Conservative Party, who would be wholly unreconciled to it. But I reckon we'd be lucky to get another referendum within 20 years. And this is the point, folks. Had Remain won, you would not see a single news headline saying there should be a second referendum. They would have carried on ever more deeply integrating us inside the European Union. And I kind of think if we do head on this course towards the 29th of March next year, probably the stuff we're hearing from the establishment will become even more hysterical. That at least is my guess. Peter in Enfield, does Dominic Raab strike the right note, or is he doing it because there's such chaos over the checkers Good morning, Sir Nigel. Good um, morning. Well, the question here is, uh, the words are right. The real question is, do you believe him? Uh, absolutely. Because I think this really seems to be just like another of the, sh the soft shoe shuffle by a Remain government pushing up another mouthpiece going, look, we're doing it, we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and I don't believe it. I think this is the position that a Remain entrenched government has had from day one, and this is just another squirm along the way. Um, the EU knew from day one that the government headed by Theresa May was a Remain convicted government. Um, had it been different, that the leadership was from working from a, a conviction point of let's get out, the whole negotiation tone would have been a totally different thing. Have, um, have, you, still could have, be. have you ever, like, and, and I can hear the tone of your voice on this, have you ever been as cynical about a British government? Never. I've, I've voted for three parties over the course of my life, um, yep. one of which was yours, which I'm yep. happy to say provoked um, Greasy Cameron into giving the referendum, which he would never have done of his own volition. It oh, was good only Lord weakness man. and cowardice that, that caused that. Yep. And thank you for that. So one up to you. Um, on the point of trust, what trust? They're a bunch of kickback artists who do anything to keep the money flowing. <laughs> Their money, not ours. That's uh, the really how train yeah, well. cannot be interrupted. So, 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 I mean, Peter, is it possible? Is it possible that Mrs. May has been so shocked by the response to Checkers that she said to Rob, "Right, we're changing direction. We're going to get tough." Is it possible that you could still give her the benefit of the doubt? I believe it, it is possible, that's, like a, that's a famous legal question, that was, is it possible that this could happen? And in the real world, anything's possible. <laughs> yeah. Do I believe? Yes, I do believe that the reaction that she got to the checkers stitch up uh, was such a slap in the face that she didn't know quite whether she was coming or going. Mm. But there's not really much of a change there. Um, but it's all <laughs> dipping her up with a bang that she just couldn't keep it rolling along. Something had to give. And as I said just now, I think this is... Um, I don't know. It's one small step for mankind and not a very big step for anybody else. <laughs> Sticking down and rub up to make noises that sound right. Um, but I say again, the question is, do you believe him? Yeah, no, me, absolutely. Do not. Uh, no, and I'm struggling too. Peter, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Richard is calling from, is it Gure in France, Richard? Uh, Gure. Gure, right, I did my best. I did my best. So, <laughs> do do you think that Mr. Raab is going to become like Rambo, going to turn up in Brussels, going to really, really uh, put the screws on Barnier? Uh, basically, no. I think uh, he's been allowed to say, and he might believe it, that we're not going to give the EU the money if we walk away. Um, but I think that's in full knowledge of Theresa May, who thinks 
that we aren't going to walk away and she's just going to give away more and more um, concessions. I mean, it's a good way of covering up the part of the Chequers plan where our biggest growth industry, which is services, is going to be under this plan, given the rules to Brussels to control it. Now, that seems silly that we're going to allow them to control what we do and the fact that we're leaders in this field. It's likewise that in the past, she has actually allowed junior ministers in the Ministry of Defence to start signing papers, committing us to an EU army. Uh, And that was buried in some other form of... uh, uh, announcement. Well, yeah, I mean, they would say that it's just closer cooperation, but hey, you can read these no, it things. Isn't. It's uh, step in the direction of the French, Germans, uh, and the Italians getting a cheap army, and uh, in fact, uh, the Dutch and the uh, Danish getting a full time army because they don't have one themselves. Um, but that's my personal view, being any yeah, forces. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So tell me, uh, Richard, are you are you retired in France? I am retired in France, and we came over here uh, to one have a more affordable life. To be quite honest with you, yeah. and we left. We believed all the uh, <laughs> the programs on how you could uh, do your own thing, but uh, it was very much an eye opener when you move into a country that is receiving very large benefits from the EU and still not meeting its commitments of paying into it. Well. And, and yet, Richard, you say that, and yet there's a lot of Eurosceptic opinion in France, isn't there? Uh, there is, but there's uh, a very large amount of uh, expat uh, Ramonas, uh, which I think a large percentage of those are more interested in losing the uh, value of their property because the housing market over here is stagnant uh, and yeah. the French ain't going to buy it, you know, when no one else is if we leave. Um, You know, I'm prepared to walk away from what I've got because I believe in the United Kingdom. Well, Richard, I don't think anyone's going to force you to leave because of Brexit. I'm I'm very confident that that is not going to be the case. Richard, I thank you for your call, for your point of view. My, 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 what a cynical bunch of people you all are. Let's ask Mark in Shingford. Does he believe Dominic Raab when he says they're not going to get our money unless? Do you know what? I don't know whether I do or don't believe the man. Mm. However... I just feel that the, the Brexiteers have wanted someone to speak up for the country. So the man finally speaks up for the country, and now yep. we're questioning whether he's, he's, it's truthful or not. So what I do think, we want? Well, Mark, had this happened before the Chequers Accord, we might have been more than prepared to believe it. But I think the timing that Chequers has gone down like a lead balloon, you've seen the polling in the Sunday Times, suggesting that you know people are so enraged that a new Brexit party could become the biggest in Parliament, uh, you know you, whether you believe it or not. Um, so, it's, it, Mark, it's the timing of it, I think, that people are questioning. Well, we, we, the man's new in his job, so his timing is is not his fault. So he's coming in with a plan, with an idea, and we should be backing it if we believe in Brexit. The problem is, is that you know what I've spoken to you a few times on the show. Yeah. My, my dad's a huge fan of yours. I was undecided. Um, you've grown on me. Uh, and, I, and I believe that you, being on LBC, you, you've given yourself a, a new platform to potentially try and lead the country. Now, well, I don't know about that, Mark, but, but, well, I mean, well, but I mean, but I mean, but, but, but I mean, well, and of course, you Mark. Have, because you're, but you're winning me. You've won me over for a start. Okay. So I believe that you could potentially run the country. The same as the, the Najib Moir, I believe he could be the best mayor in London. I think he'd be phenomenal. But that, that's a, an, another, another conversation. But what my point is, is that what, whoever goes into, into who, whoever starts to run this country whilst this Brexit thing is going on, it's going to be a divide because it was virtually a 50-50 split between leave and stay. So n- no one can make a right decision because there's always going to be half the country that disagrees with the other. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, but, but surely, Mark, it's in circumstances like that that you want good, clear consistent leadership and i wonder whether we're getting it mark i thank you um, meanwhile a conservative mp dominic grieve thinks leaving the eu with no deal would put the uk in a state of emergency he must have been talking must he to george osborne remember all his threats uh, that if we left there'd be emergency budgets and all the rest of it so uh, you know the game is on uh, everywhere we go now the weather is dominating many of your conversations i'm here 
on the eastern side of the USA, where everything is green. It is raining like crazy. And I have to say, yesterday evening was distinctly cool. That is not the case in the UK, as what I think is the best summer in 42 years continues. In a minute, we'll ask John Ketley, how much longer does this barbecue summer go on? You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 11.45. Well, you only have to see the television, the British Open golf at, um, going on at Carnoustie to see the brown fairways and to realise what an incredibly hot, dry summer we've been having in the United Kingdom. And, of course, it was on this show back in March that legendary weatherman John Ketley told us the Wimbledon fortnight would be the time to have our barbecues. And he got it right, and he's joining me now. Good morning, John. Yes, good morning, Nigel. Perhaps I should get out now while I'm on top, should I? <laughs> yeah, well, in, in, in many ways in life, that's right. Um, <laughs> it's got um, but, a possible uh, comment on your No, thing. absolutely. <laughs> um, John, it just, I mean, it seems to, this weather just seems to go on and on and on. What's it, going it, on? It does, doesn't it? But, of course, um, winter into spring seem to go on and on and on. True, you know, true. It, no, it, no, absolutely. It, it never seemed to get any warmer, and then the snow came back when we wouldn't expect it, necessarily. Uh, but, yes, it is exceptional at the moment. It is very similar to some of the previous summers that we've had. Not too many, I've got to say, because we've had some lousy summers, really, since a uh, very good one in 2006, an extremely good one in 2003. Uh, but really, 2006 was followed by some very wet summers, and we got used to having a rather uh, difficult time to get the barbecues out. But at the moment, yeah, things are looking pretty good. We had um, some extremely hot weather only five years ago. We do tend to forget these things. There was a lengthy heat wave in 2003, around right about this time. The temperature reached 28 degrees, for example, somewhere in the country on 19 consecutive days. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, we are starting to beat that now, of course, because this hot weather is going to continue throughout this week, at least across England. It's not always going to be the same throughout the UK, but across central and eastern England, there is more really hot weather continuing this week and probably into next week as well. Uh, so you start looking at the record books and you start thinking in your memories of uh, when it was anything like this before. We all remember 1975 and 76 of a certain age, at least. Uh, but you look back to 1959, and um, even though it's not talked about very much, 1959 was exceptional. And there was a five-month period from May to September, which was extremely dry, record-breaking dry weather. And that uh, that summer was very dry, very hot at times, and it continued throughout September. Now, I'm, I'm not forecasting that at the moment, Nigel, though you, uh, yeah. you you feel free to come back in September and say, well, John Ketley said that. <laughs> no, I won't. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I want to know. I mean, the kids are broken up, so it was the big, the big getaway over the course of the weekend. Yeah. Are the kids going to have a reasonable few weeks? Well, I think they are, yes. At the moment, you look, you always look to law of averages and think, well, it's got to end sometime, and then the rains will come, yeah. and it'll get very wet, and it'll never stop raining, and you'd be wishing you had the sunshine back again. We all remember Dennis Howell in 1976. He was appointed the Minister for Drought, and within five days, the rain arrived, and then it was one of the wettest ever <laughs> autumns uh, that we've ever seen. Uh, Maybe we need it again, because, I mean, it looks, <laughs> yeah. it, it's looking pretty dry out there, isn't it? Well, it is. This green and pleasant land is, is just history book now uh, because it's all gone very brown. I mean it combines with the with the harvest and of course the the barley and the the wheat all goes that color anyway naturally but yes the race tracks and everything else unless they watered the football grounds the pleasure the fields uh, playing fields they've all gone very brown and they do desperately need some water but at the moment you'd have to say although there will be uh, little banks of uh, rain coming in from the Atlantic during the next two weeks most of it will be in the in the northwest of Scotland in particular there'll be a few uh, showery bands coming across across England and Wales as we go through the uh, end of this week and into early next week as well. Uh, so there will be some of that rain coming across, but it, at the moment you'd have to say that by and large the hot weather is going to continue for quite continue. some time yet. And finally, John, is it just Brexit Britain that's enjoying this drought, or is the rest of Europe experiencing this too? No, I mean, they are more used to it than we are. They're very, uh, obviously, continentally locked, so they, they don't get much influence from the Atlantic that we would get, so they do tend to have hotter summers anyway. Uh, but at the moment, yes, 33 degrees as far north as the Arctic Circle is, is, is fairly unusual. Wow. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, okay. so we're all, we're all enjoying <laughs> that, but they, they do tend to get more storms breaking out than we see. John, terrific. Thank you. We'll speak to you very soon. That was John Ketley telling us if you've broken up, you're on holidays or you're worried about what to do with the kids, the weather is going to stay OK. Back to Dominic Raab and a slightly tougher line. Do we believe him? Um, well, I've got Athene says to me on Twitter, Dominic Raab is the full guy for this treacherous Ramona government. Goodness me, strong words for a Sunday morning. Let's go to Chichester and talk to Carl. Good morning, Carl. Yeah, hi, Nigel. 
So, is this the new approach to Brexit? Are they at last about to get it right? Well, I think it's just smoke and mirrors, and what Dominic Raab is doing is essentially copying someone else's homework, because Jacob Rees-Mogg has said that, that the idea of giving them money without anything in return would be voted down and that they have the numbers to do that. So yep. Dominic Raab standing up and claiming this is some his negotiating position is just almost, in a way, dishonest. Um, <clears throat> I'd also say that him promoting himself or being promoted into Theresa May's Remainer, you know, war cabinet, um, is really, I mean, Ollie Robbins is still there, Theresa May yep. is still there. Yep. So the idea of him being put up, it's just more Tory okay. mirrors. It's just so, dirty tricks. So no change in your view? Oh, no, not at all. And, and the thing is, is you, you shouldn't trust Theresa May. You can't keep, you know, it's like having a tenant. You, 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 you rent a room out to someone, and every, every day you come home and someone's nicked money out of your, your purse. At some point, you're just going to have to say, well, I need to get rid of this person, and we can't keep letting Theresa May get away with doing the same things over and over again. No, Carl, couldn't be clearer. What does John in Ryslip think? Good morning, John. Uh, good morning, Nigel. Yes, uh, I'm a proud Ramona, I'm afraid, so uh, go easy. No, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't don't be afraid. I mean, we I do live in a... your show, which is uh, rather strange, isn't it? But there you go. No, John, you know what? <laughs> the, the point is, and I fully respect people who have a different point of view, that is what democratic debate is all about. So, John, Ramona from Rise Lip, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, just wondering, between the um, Chequers deal and what's been termed now no deal, what what would be your preference? I'm taking it no deal. Is that is that true? Uh, if I said to you, John, I tell you what, mate, um, I've got a really bad deal for you. Do you want it? What would you say? Well, I don't know if it is a bad deal, but uh, it, it, it's not a great deal, to be honest. I, I think mean, we've John, uh, wasted a lot of time, haven't we? We've wasted two years. Let me ask you something, and, right? Yeah. And, and I haven't answered you fully. I agree, but let me just ask you something. Do you understand why the Brexiteers are so angry? Uh, yes and no. Um, I understand that there's a desire, a very strong desire among some people to break away from the EU completely, which I, I get that. But on, the, on the, the other side of the coin, I, I, there was a lot of talk before the referendum about Norway deals, Switzerland deals, you know, staying in EEA, for example, all these things that we, we, um, we you know, were promised or, or suggested as alternatives. And um, I don't think that we've necessarily, um, I think the, 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 the tune has changed significantly amongst the Brexiters to being quite a hard Brexit now. And, um, you know, beyond just leaving the customs union single market, etc., but actually going to no deal whatsoever, I think is uh, really quite a significant move in, in, their, in their position. Well, America has no trade deal with us. China has no trade deal with us. We do a heck of a lot of business with both those countries, don't we? We do. I mean, I do my own business. I have a um, uh, small internet services business, and uh, I, uh, I export successfully around the world to USA and India and, and across Europe as well. But um, I'm wondering what, um, what the impact of no deal is and who would take responsibility for it. You know, just look at my business. Um, do I start, need to start researching WTO tariffs? Is it something that, um, you know, people like me need to be well, aware yeah. of? And, and, do, do, and do you know what, John? For? Do you know what, John? I was talking six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, to one of Britain's best-known entrepreneurs. Very famous guy. You see him on telly all the time. And his point was this. Please just tell us what direction you're going in. Tell us what it's going to be. Give me the hand of cards. And then as a businessman... I can play them. And I think, John, what you're really saying is you've no idea where we're going to end up with all of this. And it's that uncertainty that's making people unhappy. Is that, w w would that sum up your business case? Yeah, there's a massive amount of uncertainty. As I say, I think David Davis has wasted two years. Um, even though I'm a Remainer, as I say, I, I think I'm, I'm much more impressed with Dominic Rubb. Um, he seems to be actually got a bit of urgency about the whole thing. Well, um, John, let, let's but, really my hope main he has. Concern, my main concern is who would take responsibility for the no deal. Well, the government would. The government would. I mean, we gave our government an instruction to leave the European Union. Uh, how they do it uh, is, is, I guess, up to them. But if we were to be kept in any way inside a single market or customs union, leave voters would feel betrayed. John, you're very welcome. Do call again. Thank you. Um, and I think, finally, uh, today, I'm going to go to James in Clapham. James, hello. Hi, Nigel. So, is it, an, is it a new tone from the government, and is it welcome? 
it's an old tune whistled from an old whistle, Nigel, and the only reason that they're panicking is because they've seen uh, the rise of UKIP in the last seven days has risen by 6%. That's 6% in seven days, Nigel. Yep, yep. What do you think it's going to be in two months? Do you think she the right... She is I, panicking. I mean, yeah. She's panicking because she knows what's going to happen. The UKIP rope is going to eat her and it's going to eat Labour, and they're worried because they have stabbed us in the back, Nigel. And the only reason Brexit hasn't progressed in the last two years is because we've got spineless MPs, all 400 of them, that's blocked it at every turn. Do you, James, think that the rise of UKIP can continue? Or, uh, or, yes, do, yes, or, yes. or does this tough talk make people think, ah, oh, that's OK, we can stay with the Tories, we can stay with Theresa May? We need people like you, Nigel. We need you back. We need you in charge of that party. We need you to move forward and hold her feet to the coals, like you said you would. Well, uh, John, I've done my best over the... Uh, uh, James, sorry. I've done my best over the years. Thank you for your call. Thank you for your life advice, which I've had from many people this morning, including some saying, please, 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 don't come back. You've caused enough damage as it is. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow night at 7pm. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, it's Andrew Castle. But up next, it's Ian Payne. Thank you very much indeed, Nigel.